So I met Graham at uh, a Guardian um, masterclass in 2017, I think it was. And that probably wasn't the first one you'd done, was it? I think it might have been. I don't know. We've, I've done a few, so yeah. I'm not sure whether we did, we did one the previous year or not. Yeah. It was certainly one of the early ones, yeah. yeah. Actually, I, I don't think I had really thought about that I would write a crime novel until kind of, um, you know, kind of listening to the masterclass, really. So, um, and, and I suppose you, I, I just assumed that, if it, you know, if it wasn't an area that you knew anything about, it would be impossible to, you know, to, to write, really. So, so yeah, so that's how, that's how I, I decided I was going to write a, you know, a, a book that had a crime element. You just in. sent me an email with a, the kind of the, the synopsis of, of Alter Ego and just asked whether I could, I could help at all with the, the policing elements. And I remember, it was such a long synopsis, I remember thinking, this is <laughs> a short story, but it was good because it, it really helped me kind of think about how I could, how I could help you and how I could support. And um, uh, for those that, 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 that haven't sort of heard me talk before, know me, um, I, I'm a, a former police officer who, I'm, I'm also a writer mm -hmm. to non-fiction um, books out uh, and I've got hopefully a novel coming out sometime next year. But um, what my main, what I do mainly now is is support and and, uh, and advise authors and TV writers on policing, uh, crime, and, uh, and and other sort of similar things connected to it. And I've got a team of about um, twelve or fifteen other experts who've got different specialisms to me. I've got quite gen a general specialism, but there are some people, for example. I've got a, a psychologist who's a writer. I've got um, um, counterterrorism officers, people like so areas that I'm I'm not particularly um, au fait with. Uh, and we we work with with, with authors um, to try and inject a, a reality and authenticity in their in in their stories without making them too procedurally heavy. So I mean I'll, I'll talk later a little bit I suppose about uh, about how how Catherine was kind of the, 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 the model student really, the model client because, um, well I say it now, because you know, Catherine wanted to know the ins and outs of every aspect of the policing that she, she wrote about in her book. But when you see it on, in, in the final product, she's done absolutely the right thing and just, just kind of given it, give, give, given, it a, 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 given the reader a taster of it, so she's not got anything wrong but she's not gone delving into, you know, how you how you keep somebody in custody over more than twenty four hours, or how you take forensic samples, or you know how you search for missing people. I think you know she doesn't she doesn't, but she knows it, and that's given her the confidence and the the credibility to write it the way that she has. And that's what what we try and achieve is 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 giving authors the knowledge so that they can then take make creative decisions about how to use that to support their narrative rather than try and sort of make it into a policing textbook so yeah so that's that's what we've been doing over the last couple of years haven't we Catherine yeah, no, it's been it's been great so we had we had a few set we had one session uh via Skype I mean it you can tell it's so long it's so long ago that Zoom hadn't <laughs> wasn't no. even uh, uh well I mean maybe it was available but suddenly we, we did we, I didn't know about it um, know. so so um so we had a, quite a long chat actually about um you know so so my character uh, no, no, no spoilers, but um, you know my character is arrested, and what I wanted was to kind of really have an have an idea of how how somebody, a normal woman, you know, if she was arrested, how how she would feel, and you know, and ha, you know how um, you know how much under threat she would feel, and how she would you know how she would react. And actually, we, we talked just earlier a little bit, didn't we, Graham, about how you said that often people. If they are innocent, they'll they just won't shut up about it. They'll constantly go on and on about it. But um, but you said actually sometimes you know the, the tipping the balance kind of tips and you think well actually they're going on about it so much that they probably are guilty. So that was uh, that that was really uh, that was really interesting to, to know. Yeah. So I think she I think Alex felt very you know kind of really clammed up you know kind of didn't know how to react really at all so I think she she had I think she, at one point she talks about like my god you know you know there's I think there's um there's a local councillors a big council estate in Tulls Hill and at one point they say you know she wanted to have a shower because she kind of felt you know really grotty and 
um, she, she asked the um, custody sergeant if she could have a shower and they said, oh no, we can't because we just had a, a group of kids that have been arrested from the Tulsill estate, you know, come in. So, you know, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, all, uh, you know, and that, you know, she, all, all, you know, all of these kind of things that um, you, you, you know, you, you wouldn't kind of imagine what kind of situation somebody would be in uh, really like, like that. So I kind of wanted to kind of evoke a bit of that without actually, <laughs> actually getting myself arrested. <laughs> that's, that's a little bit too much like method acting, isn't it? <laughs> really? I could have thought that out for you. But I think, I mean, one, one of the real strengths in the way that you approached it is that you, you recognised just that, that Alex would be totally out of her depth, totally out, you know, she, she'd be a fish out of water. So what would, you know, what would be going through her head and what kind of, what, what would her priorities be? Um, so, so she would have a, um, you know, and you wanted to know the sights and the smells and the sounds of, of a custody block. Yeah. Um, she, yeah. she you, you, you'd want to, you, you know, you wanted to know kind of how people would talk to her, who would be doing what. And it's all those things that would be foremost in her mind as she's got, you know, as she's walking through those doors and, and not knowing where her life, literally not knowing where her life is going, yeah. you know, from the next moment onwards. Yeah. Sure, and 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 one of the one of the things I mean it's throughout the book it is um, her uh, being you know worried about her son as well. So when she's arrested at six in the morning, um, you know her okay yeah she's being she's being arrested for the attempted murder of her her boyfriend, but at the same time it's like what's going to happen to my seven year old son as well? So so you know so we, I think we talked at length about you know what would what would happen to to um, a child you know would they be you know kind of um, taken under the care of social services you know for instance or mm. you know, so that kind of thing as well so 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 yeah so I was trying to really understand how somebody like that would would feel so the the you know the the, the detail of the notes about you know about actually how does this step and it got me thinking, you know, some of these things that I just took for granted, how, you know, what happens, you know, what happens after an interview? What happens where, where somebody goes into, uh, you know, go, goes off and, and wants to make an application to keep somebody in custody for, for, for longer than 24 hours? Um, and, you know, how, how all that plays out. And in fact, I, I was listening to one of our, we record our Zoom calls. Uh, and I, I was listening to, to, to one this morning and I, I'm, I'm sitting there researching myself because the questions are so deep and so technical uh, that I'm going to go, how, how was that? And has the law changed on that? And, and all of this sort of thing. Yeah, um, because I get, you know, as time goes on, you know, the law, you know, is going to change and, and yeah. you know, maybe more strict in some areas. And so, so yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. we had, a, we had a, a, one of our calls was about what a, um uh dedicated detention officer what what their uniform <laughs> is and things like that as well because you wouldn't you know i'm just thinking she wouldn't know what you know so so that that officer's got a white shirt you know this one's got blue you know what's the you know what's the difference how how should i how should she react to, to them as well so yeah and i had, I had, a, I had a uh one of the team who literally just retired from the met um, he was on, on text and I'm texting him as we're having this call just to get it absolutely right. But it's spot on, you know, and, and I think, you know, it, it, it sometimes it, it, it kind of frustrates me that writers don't go to the, the lengths that you've gone to um, to find out, you know, they, they guess and, and it, it just, it, whether it ruins the story, I don't know, it ruins it for me because I know how it should be. But, but I think most readers can spot where, where writers are making it up. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to make it procedural. I mean, this isn't a police procedural. You know, this is a yeah. this is a domestic thriller. Um, but so you don't have to you don't have to make it police procedural. But if you're going to talk about policing, talk about it with some credibility and and show your police officers to be as they would be with all of their you know with all of their flaws and you know with with all of their individualities that we've all got. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, and also, I mean, that, but all police. You know they're they're all individuals as well, aren't they? So they they're all going to treat people in in a different way, and you know, and it's we talk a lot these days about unconscious bias a, a, as well. So I was kind of imagining. So what you know, so one of the um, detectives, you know, she she really feels like she's you know she's she, Alex really feels like she's got it in for Alex, and she can't really understand why. 
um, and she, you know, I don't, I don't give anything away, but she's, um, but I, I, you know, I, with all the will in the world, I think people are going to be, you know, people are going to be like that, aren't they? But she, you know, she's also got a, um, the, uh, the custody sergeant um, is very, she, she's, she's a woman a similar age to Alex. So she feels, so she feels, you know, a, a, a real kind of affinity with, um, uh, with, with Sergeant Gibson as well. And actually, it's really sad. The um, the custody um, sergeant at the Croydon station. I mean, he it sounded. I mean, he he sounded like such a nice, you know. Yeah. Like yeah. Everybody said what a lovely guy he was, and you can imagine that he would he would do everything he could for yeah. for um, people in custody, whether he thought they were guilty or, or not. I'm, I'm sure. So. Um, Absolutely. I mean, she was a brilliant, a brilliant character, and 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 you're right. You know, I think. Um, you know, I think is it Matt, Matt Rattana, wasn't it? He, you know, from all you hear about him, he was he was the same, and many of them are. I mean, um, Catherine came on a an online um, custody inter and interviewing course um, I ran a few weeks ago, and, and on there, there's a custody officer who who who, who I'm interviewing on, you know, as uh, as the pre-record, and he's exactly the same. You know, he's exactly the same, very professional, but actually just you know wants to make everyone's life as bearable as it possibly can be in in what can be an, a dreadful situation rebecca hello we, we haven't actually met met in in person at all have we no yeah, oh, you work with lots of crime writers don't you oh, yeah I, I do i work with quite a lot of crime writers um um a surprise i actually haven't spoken to um, um graham before actually It'd be good to get in touch i mean I, I work with about 70 authors at the moment um you know from, from debut authors right right the way through to people like Peter James, Mark Billingham, mm. um, Eddie Griffiths, people like that. Um, so always happy to help out if you think you've got a crime writer that's stuck on procedure. Oh, no, law. Yeah, that would be brilliant because I have a couple of um, authors who are like doing a lot of police procedural sort of things um, as well, but also a lot of more psychological thrillers and things like that that would have useful input with how like the process works, so a bit like um, Cats. It's just really interesting to like to get to chat, to chat to everyone and like, um, yeah, and see this book into the into the world. So, yeah. <laughs> and it is in part to, it's hard to um, it's hard to sort of remember that it's that, that it's a debut. It's such a it's so good. It's you know it's such a so pacey. The characters are excellent, you know, and you've worked so hard on it. When I first started thinking about writing uh, about ten years ago, but it's you know so I, it, it yeah it, it took. It took a while for me to actually be able to physically um, do it, really. And um, but when I when I I did a Faber Academy course actually in um, at the beginning of 2017, and I think being I think there's a group of maybe 14 or 15 people, and actually having that many people also talking about wanting to write a book was was actually the impetus that I needed to. Um, you know, to, to, to do it, to give me the confidence to, to do it as well. So, so if you multiply that by however many times they do that course and then all of the other, so that, you know, it's, um, I, I just think it, and also with, um, uh, the, you know, the self-publishing, um, you know, the fact that being able to self-publish is, is ne has never been easier really. I mean, not, not to say that, that, it, that it's easy. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lot of work, but actually, you know, with Instagram, I mean, Instagram has been absolutely fantastic for, you know, for, for kind of reaching people. I mean, even, you know, in the, in the summer when I was um, editing, you know, I, I um, posted pictures of, of our cat <laughs> because she, you know, she, she'd been kind of sitting with me while I was editing and then we went out to have some lunch and she came and sat with me. So I just thought, well, you know, you, you, you kind of have to take every opportunity to... <laughs> that you can but loads of people started you know started liking posts and things because i put, you know, posted a picture of the cat so it's kind of like you know it's, it's always the cat that gets the most <laughs> 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 have, you, have you noticed a, a kind of um increase in people people writing um, yeah, there's been a lot more inquiries, a lot more, um, I've heard a lot more people kind of like deciding to start writing and which is, which I think is brilliant and people have just been, oh, I've come up with an idea, but I don't know how to start, um, yeah. which is what oh, I always find the hardest bit. I even, think. even at a really early stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're like, oh, I don't, I kind of like, I'm not sure 
where to go or where to go with it or I've written the first draft but I think it's really rubbish and I just want to put it in the bin and I'm like oh don't, don't do that don't do that yeah. I just want to hear all about the police stuff because I, I mean I think it's interesting and like um because obviously I have a lot of I'm I guess it's fortunate to say that I haven't had any run-ins with the police so it's kind of it's kind of like oh it's totally new but then you always like you always want to write about it and it's yeah so <laughs> Understandably, it's very difficult to find information about, um, you know, the interior of a police station. You know, the plan. You know, I, I the number of times I tried to Google, um, you know, in you know, in, in you know, plan, floor plan of Brixton Police Station, and just <laughs> you know, literally nothing came up at all. So I, um, I kind of had to make it up. You know, I in in the book, um, uh, Alex's cell has yellow walls. Whether <laughs> Whether yet whether Brixton Police Station has yellow walls or not, I don't know. <laughs> well, that actually that was one thing that we did, that we did talk about quite a bit, wasn't it? About the smells, you know, metal, bo, and disinfectants. Feet. Talk a lot about feet, didn't feet. we? Absolutely. Uh, I really enjoyed the detail you went into with with all those descriptions and and your thought process as well. The detail it was it was really nice. If you watch something like Line of Duty, you get to see what's happening with the prisoner when while they're being questioned or you know while while the detectives are out you know kind of following up different leads and things. But what I wanted was for Alex to feel this kind of complete isolation that she had no mm. idea what was going on outside those four walls of the, of the cell, really. Mm. So, so it had to be, you know, what Ashok, her, her, um, her solicitor told her and, um, and the, the small amount of information that she could glean from, you know, from, uh, you know, from the police officers really as well. So, um, so I guess the Graham at that, uh, you know that one of one of the tactics of detectives will be to kind of keep um, uh, people under custody kind of pretty much in the dark will it would you say yeah and I mean yeah to, to a degree I mean it, they you know you certainly you know as a detective that's interviewing you'll you have to reveal certain aspects of the case to the solicitor that, the, yeah. that that's representing but that by no means uh, equates to revealing all of it and and you will always hold things back um, because sometimes because you want to you want the person to tell you tell them yourself yeah. the self, or you want them to assume something that if they're guilty will mean x and if they're innocent will, will mean y so yeah. Yeah. you know a good example is 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 forensic material so you know if you if if you have a a dna um that their dna on on a on a knife or something like that then you know, you're, you'll ask them all sorts of kind of very vague questions about, you know, touching the kitchen equipment in the house and, you know, did you ever cook? Did you ever do anything? You know, and, and really sort of try and get them to as far as possible say, I've never touched that knife. And then you say, we've got, we got your DNA on the knife. How are you going to explain that now? Because you just said you never touched it. Um, uh, so, and, and, and you, 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 you drop it in. But also, you know, for somebody that's in custody with murder, they're likely to be in custody over at least one night. So you, what, what you'll do is you will, will drop something into the last interview or the last, uh, in the, you know, late in the evening for them to dwell on overnight. Okay. Um, so that they can, so that, you know, if you sort of say, well, you know, obviously tomorrow morning we're expecting all of the forensic results back or tomorrow morning, you know, we, th we think we'll have got all the CCTV in and we'll have a chat with you about what that might show. Uh, but for now, that's the end of the interview and we'll see you in the morning. You know, you're not doing it to deprive them of sleep, but you're, do, you're doing it so that, that it puts them on edge. And, you know, innocent people will go crack on, you know, <laughs> you find, find what you like. You're not going to find me doing anything. Guilty people will have a very different, different approach to it. So would you, would you then watch their demeanour? Because all cells have CCTV, don't they? Would you watch their demeanour when they went back to the cell to see? Oh, no, 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 no. No, no, you can't stay up that late. <laughs> um, no, but you, but you, you know, you, you would when you come back in, in the morning, or, or you know, maybe overnight if you are still working overnight. You know, the, the custody officer would might sort of say, oh, you know, they were they were really anxious about this side or the other, or they were desperate to phone their mum, and I wouldn't let them phone, you know, or, or or whatever, you know. So you you'd pick up you'd pick up what what it was that that that, that maybe have triggered it, and then you'd go in the next day with a 
you know, with a tactic that that sort of exploited that. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. And would you say, um, you know, with with kind of mobile technology, do you think it, your job has got easier or, or just kind of more more complicated over the last sort of ten or fifteen years? I mean, I, I think it's fair to say that, that that you know, and this isn't a cop out, but it, it's just changed because yeah, with, with yeah. the with with the technology that's available to to criminals you know the technology has equally um improved that, that's available to the police so you know there, there is you know that you know we all know that you can trace mobile phone usage and uh, and, and you can um you know you, you you can generally find in the rough area where somebody is at any point that they've got their phone with them um but you know example examples of of the technology really supporting police is that Say, say you walk into somebody's house to commit a burglary, um, you're, and you've got your mobile phone with you, your mobile phone will try and pair with anything that's on Bluetooth in their phone, so in their house, so their Hive system, you know, their heating system, or their Alexa, uh, or, or anything. And, you know, with the right, you know, with, with the right sort of technical support, you can identify which phones have tried to sort of shake hands with those, with those so you, you can, you can yeah. show who's got in the hands. So, you know, whilst it's, you know, criminals can be very clever, the police can be very clever as well with technology to, um, to, 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 to prove or disprove what, what somebody's saying. Um, and it's, it's changing all the time. I mean, you know, literally is, you know, there, there, there's something new almost kind of every week, really, in terms of technology and science as well. I mean, I, you know, not here to plug my own book, we're here to plug yours. But, um, my, you know, recent book, Babes in the Wood, that I wrote, which was a non-fiction, was about, uh, a 32 year uh, murder investigation that in initially resulted in the acquittal of a, um, a, 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 of, a of the killer. Um, and it took 32 years of change in law and, and a very significant change and improvement in DNA science to be able to bring him back before the court. Do you, do you think, do you think there's a good chance if, you know, if it had been the days of, of people, you know, with, with mobiles, you know, would you think he would have been arrested? He would have been, okay, he, yeah. Kind of yeah. at the time. Oh, it, it, it <laughs> the, the, the sweatshirt. I mean, you know, the, there was the, his DNA all over the sweatshirt, but it was, you know, there was no way of of, of completely linking him at right, all. Right. Whether even though the forensic, um, uh, you know, the, the you know that you you could see that there, it had been it at the at the scene and that it was his. But not enough to put everything together to conclude right. completely. Yeah, that's right. So, so, so for those that, that, that don't know the story, he, he dumped a sweatshirt on the way after killing these these girls. He dumped a sweatshirt on the way home, and the sweatshirt um, had uh, fibres from the girls' clothing on it, um, and it had uh, ivy spores from the area where the the, the, the girls were killed. Uh, so, what what they could unequivocally say at the time was that you know that that sweatshirt shirt was worn by the killer at the time they killed the girls but what they couldn't do um save for some some paint some some paint smears that were very very similar to some that the bishop who's the killer um had on other items of clothing they couldn't say that his it was his sweatshirt and it wasn't until the the late well basically about 2016 um, that the science had changed, and they actually found through the through the very sensitive techniques they use his DNA all over the sweatshirt and his partner's DNA all over the sweatshirt, and um, some some traces of his his dog's DNA on on the sweatshirt as well. So the the, the reinvestigation and the reprosecution was all based around DNA science that simply wasn't available at the time. But going back to the question about, you know, was if the technology had been around in 1986 when this happened, would he have been caught? Yes, he would, because he would have had a mobile phone and it, we would have been able to track where it had been and, and, and where, you know, because he was lying. I mean, he was lying all over the place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think I remember you saying that you kind of, everybody had an inkling that he was behind it, didn't you? It was just you couldn't prove it. Is that right? Oh, yeah, no, well, absolutely certain. Absolutely certain that he was behind it. Um, and in fact, the, the, the case failed. I mean, if, if those things had been in place, the case wouldn't have failed, but it failed because um, the, the prosecution was, was badly handled uh, and the, 
the, the prosecution put a put put the uh, this is supposed to be about your book. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> um, but the prosecution failed because the 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 the, the barrister um, got himself into a corner where he gave a time of death uh, for the girls, and he stuck by that even though there was a credible uh, and and correct sighting of the girls fifteen minutes after that time of death. Right. So the judge said, "Well, if you don't." We don't think the girls were dead by half past seven. You must acquit, and they, and they weren't dead by half past seven because someone saw them at quarter to eight who knew them. But um, also, it's, hasn't it been proved that now that the time of death is actually, you know, um, there are so many contributing factors that it's actually very difficult to pinpoint. Yeah, a, a yeah that's right. And you, you'll never get a pathologist nowadays to give a to give us yeah. a, a specific time of death. I mean, they'll say, you know, they, they'll say they died ten years ago or they died yesterday. They can tell the difference. <laughs> But they won't say, you know, they died. They died just after Coronation Street last night. <laughs> uh, you know, but, and if you ask them, they will literally say. I mean, what was what, what, the the class you did? I take it Stuart Stuart Hamilton was there. Was he Catherine? Yes. The, the, the pathologist. Yes. He, he did. He yes. didn't do some of the later ones, which is a shame because and he, he did. He did. Yeah. He, he's so he's so funny, and he's um he advises on um uh oh god what's oh I can't think of the uh, silent witness. He's, silent he's, witness. He's yeah. rise of the silent witness and he's he's always on telly commentating on various things on true crime but he says you know if he's asked if he's asked by a, a police officer what when a, when the person died he'll say sometime between when they were last seen and, and uh, when they were last seen alive and when they were found <laughs> dead and that, that's his that's his scientific answer that he gives because there's so many variables um so but, yeah but i guess that, now because there's there is so much other forensic evidence that 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 it, it might have been had more um important you know 20 years ago or 30 years ago but so much other um evidence you know is 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 absolutely more you know pinpointable now as well I yeah think. yeah and and you know and things like you know things like mobile phone use you know people people you know people's use of vehicles cash transactions everything's traceable these days and sometimes it's it, it's you know it, it, it's their lack of use that proves you know that, that that proves where they are. So you can certainly show that that somebody could be the killer, you know, if you know they think, oh, I'll, you know, I'll turn my phone off because I'm going to go and stab somebody. So they turn their phone off and then they go and do whatever they're going to do, and then 20 minutes later they turn it turn it on, and every other hour of the day their phone is on and being used, but you know, for, for all around the time of death it's off. So that that's suspicious in its own light. So but that wouldn't be enough, sort of, sort of evidentially to convict somebody, though, would it? Oh no, no, no. But it would certainly it would certainly point towards them. They'd certainly have a lot of difficult questions to answer yeah. about, you know, about you know. So your phone is never off, but but over the time that this this murder happened, sort of question you'd leave for them late at night and get them to talk about it in the morning. <laughs> In terms of kind of policing in the next kind of ten years, what what do you think are going to be the the, the challenges? You know, kind of um, COVID aside, maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, I you know, I, I think um, I, I I think you know people will uh, more and more crime, and, and I think this could be related to COVID. It's happening anyway. More and more crime will be will, will be less interactive in between you know between individuals out in the street. I think we're seeing more cyber crime, more fraud more scams that, that that sort of thing um i think you know people's use of technology will become more sophisticated and as i say the police is the police is used will as well sometimes i think that the the the, the quality of of the forensic evidence that's available and now could actually go against the police because it dna dna is so sensitive you know if i I, you know, pick up my phone here, and if it wasn't my phone, I picked it up, I put it down. My DNA is now all over that phone. Um, so anybody that picked it up, their DNA would be all over that phone. So whereas before a DNA hit generally hinted that the person was responsible for, you know, leaving that that DNA sample, be that blood, semen, saliva, whatever, you know, on that item uh, it, for, for some nefarious reason. You know the fact that practically everybody's DNA could be on there. I mean, I've just put it down on my son's sunglasses case, so his DNA will be from the sunglasses case onto my phone now. So, just being able to prove that you know DNA, a DNA um, 
a sample DNA example what, what was actually you know on that that item because the person committed the crime I think it's going to become more and more difficult because with juries you only have to introduce an element of doubt and there and, and the person's acquitted so you know it's not difficult to run a defense but, uh, but, do, but do you think um kind of catching up the you know the um the level of um you know, of, of the, you know the, the depth of of how you can kind of analyze the, um, the 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 DNA might also become more more kind of sophisticated as well. It, it, I mean, it, it it could do. I mean, the 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 the, the main flaw really is it, is being able to time when 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 a, a, a you know a cell because it's cellular material. That's what that's what they're finding. Yeah. That cellular material has actually um been deposited on the item concerned so if you know if, if you were to say well you know we can we can kind of age that 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 item uh, that 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 dna from on that item to you know within the last few days rather than you know three weeks ago then i think i think yeah. then i think you're starting to you're starting to be able to disprove people's people's defenses but I think it needs to, you know, that's the next step, really. It's being able to, 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 to not only identify the DNA, but also interpret when and how it was deposited. Sure, sure, yeah. And um, cy I guess cyber crime um, is, is going to be a, a massive area in, in terms of um, the, the work that detectives do and 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 you, I'm just thinking about you know the you know police are so underfunded but I, but I can imagine that the that 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 um, uh, investing in you know kind of um, cyber crime is going to is going to eat eat up the kind of police budget massively but you you know you, it it's really important you know it, it it's vital isn't it that um, it is. To, keep, to keep ahead of, or to keep up, you know, up with the with the you know with the criminals as well. No, it, it is. But the you know the, what one of the real the the, the, the real kind of issues with, with cybercrime is, is to you know to to to, to prove or to, to prosecute an offence in the UK. You, you know, you generally you have to the offence has to have been committed in the UK. I mean, there are exceptions, but. Uh, and so much for cybercrime, particularly the scans, you know, that we've all we've all had them. We've all had the emails telling you that you know that that we're we're, we're a beneficiary in a will, and yeah. we've just you know we've all had that. Yeah. That they're you know they're not they're not generated from from this country, so it's it's virtually impossible to um, to, to to track down the offenders and, and, and bring them bring them to justice. So I think I think the, the you know the, the emphasis has to be around you know target hardening vulnerable people. Um, you know, prevention messages, all of those sorts of things, um, because you're not going to detect your way, you're not going to arrest your way out of that cybercrime problem. It's always going to be there. But if you can, you know, if you can kind of put this ring of steel around people, particularly the more vulnerable people who are going to be targeted in the first place, then that that's the way to deal with it. But you know, prevention isn't great crime fiction. You know, no one wants to read about a crime that hasn't happened. <laughs> Can you see any, Rebecca? Can you see any uh, any new trends in uh, in crime writing? Um, I'm seeing a lot of um, kind of actually a lot of people are uh, moving slightly more towards the psychological elements at the moment. Um, so I've had quite a lot of submissions with sort of like dissociative personality disorder and that sort of thing. But also, as Graham was saying, there's kind of a lot of um, sort of of moves to walk cyber as well which is great but also as I said not great for a novel so that was, I was just going to actually ask Graham is there sort of a would you say in the police it's moving more towards like sifting through data as opposed to actually on the foot police work in... oh hugely yeah hugely I mean when when I when I retired from the police which was in um, 2013 when you know when you arrested somebody generally you know, data-wise, you'd seize um, you'd seize a computer, uh, maybe a, a tablet or an iPhone, and, and that would be it. Nowadays, you know, practically everything holds data. So, and this is you know, th this is why so many um, so many rape trials collapse is because the police are literally overwhelmed with um, with data, with messaging, 
uh, with with just the way people interact these days. You know, they're overwhelmed with information, and they have to go through all of that information to um, to, to to check whether there's anything that might undermine their case. And you know, as we've seen, um, and it's worked both ways that the you know the police have have either found or missed um, so some really important data that could have could have put people you know could have put guilty people in prison or kept innocent people out of prison but they are completely overwhelmed at the moment with with, with that and it's not going to get it's not going to get any easier and so do, um, yeah. oh sorry oh um i was just gonna say so do like kind of detective stuff need to be a lot more tech savvy now so kind of or do you have like departments that you can kind of send it away to or is it there are, I mean, there are, there are departments. It has to, I mean, to, to, to gather something evidentially, it has to be, it has to be um, submitted to, you know, for, for forensic technical uh, mm. investigators. Uh, so, so, you know, they're specialists, they're not police officers generally, they are, <coughs> they're, they're trained techies really. Uh, and they, they, you know, they, there's a particular forensic way in which they have to retrieve the, retrieve the data. Mm. But police officers have to be more aware of, of, of what holds data, how to preserve that data, um, about where, you know, where, where, where the, 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 the evidential data is likely to be held rather than, you know, the, the, the kind of ancillary data that we all, we all have. Mm -hmm. So they have to be more aware. They don't actually have to, to do the investigations and, you know, do the technical side themselves, but they have to be pretty switched on about, you know, what might, what might hold, hold data and therefore what might hold evidence. Mm, oh, that's because that's uh, that reminds me there's another sort of trend i've been seeing with a lot of books that are talking about the dark web and yeah. all that sort of thing and i guess it's just interesting to see how technology is kind of morphing more into crime and it's less more like running like less chase scenes and kind of more like oh my god how these links all together and sort of a bit more like almost like sherlock kind of pulling pulling together clues instead of kind of like actual on the beat if that makes sense but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's very, very little crime is detected on the beat. These yeah. <laughs> if only. Talking about the dark, the dark web, just before lockdown, I was, I was on a train to London. There was one of um, uh, the DCs that used to work on my division. Uh, we were chatting on the train and he now works for, I want to say, I want to say Hewlett Packard, but I'm not sure it is. But anyway, work. and he's the, he's head of, their, head of, head of cyber security in the UK for them. And he, he said to me, he said, you know, we'll meet up and I will show you how the dark web works. Oh. We had lockdown. And so I'm, I'm, I've still got that one. To, uh, and I was hoping that's going to go, but I think Boris is going to tell me very soon. I was going to tell you, Boris is, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, but I, you know, because I'm fascinated with that. And I'm, I, I'm, I'm reading, a, um, reading a book by an author called Chris Merritt at the moment, um, which, which um, has got elements of the dark web in there. Uh, and Chris, is, Chris is actually one of one of our advisors. He's a he's a chartered psychologist, mm. uh, and I'm fascinated to 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 know where he's you know where he's found that out because everything. I mean, he's he was really worried when he. It, it's a published book. It's not a um. It's not mm. a book I'm reading. I'm advising on. He was really worried because he's oh, you're going to find loads of policing errors in there, and I haven't. It's really good. Mm. Um, so I know that whatever he you know, it, he, the information he's got around the dark web is probably as you know as well researched as his policing was. Mm -hmm. yeah. but your new book is your your new fiction book is is that it's around the dark web or that comes into it as well doesn't it Brian no no mine, mine's about vigilantism oh okay, okay. It's about what happens when um uh when, when policing is cut so bad so so, so much that the the state-sponsored vigilante vigilantism takes over and uh, mm. uh how the two collide and um, lots of people die in it and, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm literally. I mean, nice I'm, I'm, high body count then. Madam? A nice high body count then. Oh, horrendously high. We've, <laughs> we have, I've had to arrange a very ingenious way of disposing of bodies, which involved me going to a um, a, a Victorian um, pumping station in Hove, which has a furnace that burns at about 700 degrees, so that um, we can work out how to incinerate these bodies now. <laughs> I was talking to the boiler man and I said, look, I'm honestly, I'm writing a book. No people say that all the time. I'm writing a book. I'm not going to kill anybody. But it's, it's fascinating what, um, what bizarre avenues you can get, you can end up going down in, um, in your research as well. But actually I'm, you know, having had a, um, a career in design all my life, you know, detail is what I really love and kind of getting the details right and just the right typeface and just the right color is, you know, is what, you know, I, I really love 
you know about my work but I think I found that with um with writing as as well actually so I think you you know you need to it's those little details and making you know and and knowing exactly how that furnace you know how it would, would work and how long it would take to burn a body and you know that that you know and do you need to put petrol on it <laughs> those kind of those kind of things and, uh, you know that that's that absolutely shines through with, your, with, with the way you approached alter ego you know you in particular, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to go into any spoilers, but the, the final scenes where there, there's a very, a, a very short kind of police involvement in those final scenes. Yeah. But, you know, wanting to know exactly how that would happen and the kind of person that would be, I don't want to give too much away, but the kind of police officer that would be dealing with that particular thing and what they might be thinking that, that attention to detail that you, you talk about absolutely shines through everything well, that was one of the conversations we had that i really enjoyed actually because i knew what i wanted to happen but i didn't know whether i was able to 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 do that and we kind of together we worked worked out how we'd be able to do that didn't we which was yeah. was really fantastic and being able to kind of collaborate in, in that way was um, yeah and that, that, that's what I love. I, mean, I love those conversations where, where authors say to me, you know, oh, you know, I know it probably wouldn't normally happen this way, but I want it to happen. And we literally, you sit down on a Zoom call, or I think that was a Skype call, wasn't it? Old-fashioned Skype call, as you say. <laughs> and and we, you kind of, you work it out between you. You work, you know, you literally work it out. I'm Marie Christine, and I was really taken, suddenly, the fiction was real, right? I was sitting, I, was, I read it in, very very quickly and i thought oh my god i can't believe she never rang me to tell me that such horrible thing had happened to her so i thought that was quite interesting you know when you when it i mean i think with all fiction we always want our fiction to be a sort of reality but i think that's uh you know it was that was tremendous if you're in the moment as soon as you pick it up i mean that's always that's always a good sign i think you start writing a, a book like this with do you have the end already formulated and then you've got to sort of work backward or no, no, it, no not, not so, at all. It, in fact i came to see you the day that i did the masterclass with graham at the guardian which was yeah. in the middle of 2017. yes i, I remember you came, yeah. <laughs> I'd started writing, but I, I, at that point, I didn't know it was going to be a crime novel at all. And, um, right. and so I just, what was it going to be? What, what did you have in mind to write? Well, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I think okay. I was thinking more about, um, uh, you know, kind of relationships and, you know, because, as you know, I'd, I'd done quite a lot of dating at that point as well. Yes. So yes. It was yes. about, That's uh, another thing that I'm thinking, my God, is this fiction? Is it reality? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we've known each other for several years, but it's a um, <laughs> oh, uh, several, several decades. Have to, I have to have a chat with you. <laughs> um, no, a lot of it is made up. I didn't do it. I didn't do. I didn't do everything. To be able yeah. to kind of delve into, a, you know, a, a story where you. I mean, literally, yeah. it's like when you when you sit down and start writing. You know, it's like it's actually like yeah. the book actually takes over and drives it yeah. like, like a driverless yeah. car. Really, you're, you're you're actually just going along for the ride. Really, it's bizarre. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. so that was really, you know. So, and not all days are like that. I mean, some days, and also because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm do, you know, doing uh, design work. You know, the mo most of the time as well. So, um, but on days when I was able to write and it, and it came kind of flowing out, it was fantastic. But, but literally, you, you're just kind of taken along. Yeah, and, you're like um, a fountain. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Really. So it's um. Yeah. So yeah. So so. But it was it was doing the masterclass at the Guardian that where I thought actually because I thought you know but you you start writing about your experiences. Mm -hmm. And okay, that they're in, they're interesting to you, but they might not be interesting to other people. So actually, when I when I saw that there was this crime writing masterclass, I thought, well, actually, why don't you know? I can bring the two together, you know, some, yeah. somehow. <laughs> so, yeah, that's uh, right. But I'm yeah. I'm already planning another one, so so I'm, I'm going to right. So um, what, what is it the same genre or? Um, probably, but, may, but, di but different, but di the sa same kind of area, I suppose. Um, but, but I, you know, I'm really fascinated with um, the, you know, the, the idea of, of, of normal people being, being thrown into kind of extraordinary situations. Oh, well, mm. um, well, I ho hope you have a, a lovely evening, everybody. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank to you. Work. No, it's yeah. great.